them a note and say, hey, we missed you. You know, I know some of you noticed, but uh, last week, Mary Alice was back with us. She's here again this week. She'd been gone for like 12 weeks. She just couldn't get over her sickness. Praise God, she was well enough, and it looks like she's back out in the land of the living. So anyway, just great to see Mary Alice back. But you know, you might have looked across a month ago and said, well, where is that Mary Alice, you know? And you might be able to write a note. That's partly why I do it too. You just look around and recognize who may be here and who isn't, all right? If you have your Bible, open back to the book of 1 Samuel 25. We're going to begin here. Three weeks ago, we looked at the death of Samuel. And um, I need to do one final thing to, 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 uh, to finish that little look at before we look at the, the main subject of the chapter, which is this famous guy named Nabal and his wife Abigail and how that whole thing plays out. But if you remember three weeks ago, I'm sure you do because your minds are like a steel trap. You know where we are. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, we, were at, we were looking at the death of Samuel, verse 1. Then Samuel died, and all Israel gathered together and mourned for him and buried him in his house in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. We looked at a number of things about Samuel, how interesting his life was, that God had called him as a young child, of course, in a sense, a miraculous birth, at least a very special birth, right? I mean, in answer to his mother's prayers that God would give her a child. And so, uh, and then all these years of serving the Lord as this judge, the last judge, the first prophet uh, for God. And we talked about the fact that he was a prophet. We talked about the fact that he was a man of prayer. That was one of the things we really focused on was that this was a man who prayed for the people. He said that I might not sin by failing to pray for you. And we talked about how important prayer is. And then we talked about how the people praised him. I mean, again, in verse 1, he talks about how the, the people gathered and mourned for him and buried him. There was, there was great sorrow in the nation of Israel over the death of Samuel. Because he was sort of like the, the glue that was holding this whole thing together. I think people understood that with the death of Samuel, they weren't really sure what the future held. When that generation passed away, they weren't sure because he seemed to be a, a restraining force to Saul and all the things that he wanted to do. And he seemed to be that connection to God that was going to be missing. And uh, so I think the people mourn for a lot of reasons. But I want you to go with me now just real quickly to the book of Psalms. And I want you to come to Psalm 12. I, I, I stopped here and so that's why I say I just want to come back and briefly mention three quick things if I could about this particular psalm. I mean certainly Samuel's influence, Samuel's example... Samuel's devotion, Samuel's life, Samuel's prayer. I mean, that was very impacting in the life of the people of Israel. And here was young David. He was fleeing from the pursuit of Saul. He was wondering what the future held, though Samuel had anointed him as king. I think David understood how important, again, the life of Samuel was. And so I think it at least is possible that as David wrote the words to Psalm 12, he may have been at least reflecting back on the death of Samuel when he wrote these words, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. There are three things real quickly that I just want to mention about Psalm 12 because I think it, again, I think it will help us transition to Nabal and Abigail. The first question I think we can ask out of verse 1 is this, where are the faithful? I mean, where are the faithful? David said, help Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, the faithful disappear. We're living in a time and a day and age in which it seems to me that faithfulness is just kind of going by the way of the Etzel. If you remember the Etzel, you're like me, you're old. You know, okay, I'll put it a little bit, maybe in a little bit more. It, it, it's gone the way of the Walkman. Okay, okay, maybe a little, let's see. It's gone the way of the Samsung. <laughs> oh, I did a little joke there. Uh, anyway, because the iPhone, of course, has taken over. But, um, you know, it's gone the way of other old things, right? 
I mean, it's gone the way of, of, well, that was for then. That's, you know, faithfulness is sort of not looked at as it once was. And our faithfulness to God, our faithfulness to the Son of God, our faithfulness to the Word of God should be a hallmark in our personal lives and in our church's life. I can tell you it's going to be exciting ramping up between now and June 26, July 2016 as we celebrate 100 years of God's faithfulness to us and our faithfulness to Him in 100 years. A hundred years, that is unbelievable that we can remain as faithful to God. And I know that for some of you that have been around our church for many years and you, you've seen people come and go and all of us have been in other churches, I'm sure, and we can think back to those who were faithful, those who you could, you could guarantee every Sunday that person would be there. You knew that person would be able to be that encouraging word to you. There were those faithful people. And David said, where are the faithful? They're, they're disappearing. May they not be true of us. Now, there were three other kinds of people, though, that David noted were taking the place of the faithful. In verse 2, he said there are people who are full of falsehood. Instead of the faithful, there's the falsehood. There's the people who just lie and have no problem with that. Secondly, he said there were the flatterers. Flattering lips and a double heart they speak. A flatterer is that person who says what you want to hear. Wow, that was a great job. I've, I think I may have used this before, but I, I chuckle every time I see the commercial for the Geico. You know, the, you know 15 minutes can save you 15% uh, on car insurance. And they always say, well, everybody knows that, right? Then the person that says, well, did you know that Pinocchio would have made a terrible motivational speaker? And then they cut off to Pinocchio. And then he looks down in the front row. He says, you've got a lot of potential. And, and his nose goes, whoop. <laughs> Every time I see that. And then the guy's face is like this. Because he knows he's lying. You know, I mean... Uh, because that guy, all Pinocchio was trying to do was flatter him. Yeah, you've got a lot of potential. Yeah, right. Flatterers just tell you what, they, what you want to hear. It's kind of like what Paul says later in 2 Timothy, that there are those who heap teachers just because they have itching ears. They just want to hear something. Kind of reminds me of the book of, uh, book, of Luke, uh, book of Acts, where Paul was in Athens, and they just had people, they just sat around all day, did nothing but talk about philosophy and religion, and they just wanted to hear, hear one more story. Oh, okay, you, 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 why don't you tell us what you believe? The flatterers, the people who just, they don't want to ever offend you. We have a lot of flattering preachers today. Men who just, it's all about the power of positive thinking. Some of you are old enough like me to remember a guy by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. Norman Vincent Peale was one of the original power of positive, that's what his book, Power of Positive Thinking, but he was one of the first um, positive thinking preachers. And there was a famous statement said about Norman Vincent Peale, which I think is great. Here it is. Peale is appalling, but Paul is appealing. <laughs> yeah. Peel is appalling and Paul is appealing. That's true. Because all Norman Vincent Peel's job to do was to make you feel good. Well, if you want to be made to feel good, I can do that. I can tell you all you're wonderful, you're lovely, you don't have any, don't ever worry about it. We're all going to go to heaven. Doesn't matter how you live. You can be a liar, a cheat, and a swindler, and you can just be a terrible, horrible person. But don't worry about it. Everybody gets to go to heaven. You may not have as big a house as me, but we're going to all be there. You'll have a bungalow, I'll have a, you know, six-story mansion or something. I mean, I can do that if I really want it. I can make you feel good. But there's a lot of people feeling good as they're sliding to hell because we've got flattering preachers. They don't want to upset anybody's conscience. Well, David said, instead of faithful people like Samuel who spoke the truth, there are flatterers. And then there are people who create factions. I see that in verse 4. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own. Who's Lord over us? Huh. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. 
I'm going to get in and do my own thing. I'm going to say what I want, do what I want, go where I want. They come in and they create division. They create factions because they are all about themselves. They don't care about anybody else. David said, instead of the faithful like Samuel, now we have people who are trying to conquer and divide. But verses 6 to 8, David returns and he talks about the faithfulness of God's word. The faithfulness of God's um, of God's servant in verse 1, the faithfulness of God's word, 6 to 8. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. Notice now, again, the pronouns. This is English 101. <laughs> Notice the pronouns. That's important. The words of the Lord are pure as silver tried in a furnace on the earth refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. That's the words. And you will preserve him from this generation. That's the servant. That's us as his children. He will preserve his word and he will preserve his people. Praise God for that. And David says, when he starts to sum it up, when he looks around and he recognizes that if this is a reference to Samuel, Samuel's gone, and now, Lord, there's all these other kinds of people that are taking over and taking us away from the word. He is so thankful that God will keep his word. He ends it by saying, the wicked strut about on every side. When vileness is exalted among the sons of men. I thought about that verse and I thought, oh, how, how that describes certainly every generation, but oh, how it describes our generation. We're living in a time when the wicked and the vile are exalted. And it just is rampant. They strut about as if they have all the answers. There will come a day when those who are proud in themselves will find that their pride has led them down the wrong path. So I would encourage you to go back and look at Psalm 12 from the vantage point of the death of Samuel. From the vantage point of maybe David writing it and talking about how, how sad it was that the faithful were disappearing. And in its place were the people who spoke falsehood and flatteries and who created factions and divisions. So come back to 1 Samuel 25 because today we want to begin to look at the subject of Nabal and the subject of foolishness and the subject of how do we respond when things are going on in our lives. Psalm, or I mean, excuse me, uh, chapter 25 is to me a great lesson on how we can respond and how we should and how we shouldn't be responding. You know, again, let me read a portion of it at least. I, I would love to read the entire chapter, but I won't take that much time. But let's at least begin to re reading in verse 2. Now, there was a man in Moen whose business was in Carmel. Now, for those of you who know about the areas in, in, in Israel, this is not Mount Carmel where uh, Elijah was. I think I actually said that. I, as I went back and restudied, I thought, no, no, that can't be Mount Carmel. So as I went back and looked, no, it's not. It's, it's an area down south of Hebron, uh, which is in the area where Moen is. And so he didn't have his business far away. It was right there in his own home area. And the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats, and it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings, and he was a Calebite. Let's just stop right there for a minute, because we need to talk about Nabal to get started. You know, again, in this time of uh, David's life, he was realizing that now Samuel was in his tomb, he was realizing that again Samuel was dead and David had fled again. That Saul was on the prowl. Saul was going to come find him again. That's what we're going to find in chapter 26. And David, David knew that uh, Saul would never stop that pursuit really. And here was David recognizing that he needed to be um, 
a better responder. Now, Nabal, his name means fool. Now, we're going to look about some things about Nabal, but someone sent me a little story that I thought maybe illustrated well and, and asking the question, who really is the fool in this story? <clears throat> An old geezer became very bored and decided to open a medical clinic. He put up a sign outside that said, Dr. Geezer's Clinic, get your treatment for $500, and if not cured, get $1,000 back. Hmm. So, Dr. Young, who was positive that this old geezer didn't know beans about medicine, thought this would be a great opportunity to earn $1,000. So he went to Dr. Geezer's clinic. And this is what happened. So who was the fool? Dr. Young says, Dr. Geezer, I've lost all taste in my mouth. Can you help me, please? Dr. Geezer, nurse, please bring medicine from box 22 and put three do drops in Dr. Young's mouth. Um, Dr. Young, Ugh, that was gasoline. Congratulations, you've got your taste back. That'll be $500. <laughs> Dr. Young gets annoyed and goes back after a couple of days figuring to recover his money. Dr. Young, I've lost my memory. I can't remember anything. Dr. Geezer, nurse, please bring medicine from box 22 and put three drops in the patient's mouth. Oh, no, you don't. That's gasoline. Congratulations. You've got your, you've got your memory back. That'll be $500. <laughs> Dr. Young, after losing $1,000, leaves angrily and comes back <laughs> several more days later. Dr. Young, <laughs> my eyesight has become weak. I can hardly see. Well, I don't have any medicine for that, so here's your $1,000 back. But this is only $500. Congratulations, your vision is back. That'll be $500. <laughs> uh, I thought that was pretty good. Thank you, Shaughnessy. Uh, uh, I thought that was pretty good. And I, I did. I, I, since I was studying about Nabal, I said, yeah, who's the fool here, you know? I mean, obviously the guy that kept coming back thinking he could trick Dr. Geezer. And Nabal didn't even recognize that he was such a fool. I, I just list, I've jotted down for myself any number of any number of descriptive words that we could use of Nabal. Some that are right in the text and some that we can gather from the story. Certainly right here you can see he was harsh. He was a man that spoke in ways that wasn't loving. He was harsh to all of those around him. He wasn't harsh only to David. He was harsh to his men. He was harsh to his wife. He was a man who was cruel and abusive. I can imagine that his words were the kind of words that would tear down and not build up. I can imagine that the, he was a man who, who, was, um, uh, who would speak first and then even when he thought later, never go back to make it right. I've known a few people like that. Sometimes I'm like that. But I've known some men that were like that. Men who just didn't care how they spoke, when they said it, how they said it. They were just harsh. They were just cruel. You know the people like that. You've heard people like that. That's what Nabal was. His, his, the fact that he was a fool came out in the way that he spoke. He was harsh. He was evil. Interesting word. It is the... It's a, it's a very familiar word in the Old Testament that was used of, of um, disaster. And, and it, it's almost like, it's almost by using this, he, yes, he was evil. And by the way, the same, is used, same word is used, excuse me, four more times in our, in our chapter here, uh, over in verse 17 and some other places. But the idea here is that, yes, he's evil in his heart, but I think it has the idea that the man was just a disaster. I mean, I, when I think of Nabal with this kind of a word, I think of pig pen. You know, when, as he walks, there's just this stuff swirling all around him, right? That was the kind of the way Nabal was. He was a bull in a china shop. I mean, he, wh wherever he went, there was problems. He didn't seem to get along with anyone. He was, again an evil man. He was unscrupulous. He was overbearing. He was coarse. He was arrogant. 
Maybe the worst thing about him was he was rich. From the description in verse 2, 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, you, you know, you and I may look at that and say, well, big deal. No, that was a big deal in Nabal's day. The, the amount of pasture land that he would have had to have owned and, and controlled would have been huge for all those animals. He was rich. And then there is a very interesting notation there in verse 3. Did you notice it? It said he was a Calebite. Now, on the surface, probably for most of us, we think about Caleb, right? I mean, this godly man from the past, give me that mountain and Joshua and Caleb and all of that. I mean, we would, our minds would immediately go back to that and that's where my mind went to and that's where most commentators talk about that, you know, they, they, he was a Calebite in that he was living in the same area as Caleb and, and uh, he maybe had the genes from the Caleb line or something, but he certainly had nothing spiritually to connect him to Caleb. So that is at least a possibility that that's why it was so noted. But I found one very interesting note when I was looking this up. The word for dog in, uh, in the Hebrew is the same as the word for Caleb. It's the same word. And so what it may be saying is not that he was a Calebite in the sense that he's connected to Caleb. It may be saying he's like a dog. He's dog-like. Frankly, I kind of like that better than some connection to Caleb, the guy with Joshua, because he really was like a dog. I mean, again, everybody knows that we love dogs. I love dogs. Now, for you that don't know, some of you already know, we got a puppy. I have a new puppy. He is an absolute clone of Calvin. He is with me. He follows me. He finally another one that loves me in this world. And um, he just looks up at me longingly, you know, and uh, wants me to pet him and all that stuff, you know. But um, dogs are kind of funny though, aren't they? I, I mean, they can bite your hand as well as eat from your hand, right? I mean, dogs can turn on you. If you're not careful, dogs can... You know, dogs in other cultures are, are not like America, right? I mean, most dogs in most every other culture, they're just wild animals. They just roam the, the streets and dig through trash and all that stuff. They don't quite get pampered like they do in America. And um, maybe that's what more the idea here. Maybe the idea more is that, Nabal, you're like a dog. You bark and you growl and you snarl and you bite people. I think that kind of goes along with them being harsh and arrogant and cruel and abusive and evil and a disaster. I mean, let's face it, for all of us dog lovers, everybody who's a dog lover who's ever had a dog has had to clean up at least one mess that our dog has made, right? For all the things that my Calvin does, I've never figured it out, I've never been able to break him of it, he loves garbage cans. He just does. He, he thinks that's the funnest thing. He, in my office, if I walk out, I can guarantee you about two seconds after I, I hear clunk, I know what it is, the garbage can. He pulls it over. Now he doesn't make a huge mess because he's not that big of a dog, but I mean, you know, he'll, he just, okay, well I guess there's nothing in it today. You know, but if there's a gum wrapper or there's a candy wrapper, oh man, he just goes crazy. Dogs can make a mess. Dogs are, they, they just create disaster. Well, that maybe is what Nabal was. He was just this guy that everywhere he went, people said, oh, here comes Nabal. I mean, look at verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. He scorned them. He didn't treat them well because he's cruel and abusive and harsh. Now look down at verse 17. Now therefore know and consider what you should do for evil is plotted against our master and against all of his household. He is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. 
Another description of Nabal. He's a worthless man. Some of your translations say a son of Belial. A son of Belial. I mean, this descriptive term is so, is so well used about Nabal. Here's the idea. He is good for nothing. He is a good for nothing man. He is worthless. He has nothing about him that would cause us to want to be around him. Look over, just stay in 1 Samuel. Jump over to chapter 30 if you would. Jump over to chapter 30 uh, and verse 21. When David came to the 200 men who were too exhausted to follow David, who had also been left at the brook Besor, and they went out to meet David and meet the people who were with him. Then David approached the people and greeted them. Then all the wicked, here it comes, and the worthless men among those who were with David said, because they didn't go out with us, we won't give them any of the spoil that we've recovered, except to every man, his wife, and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. They were, even David was surrounded by others that were just worthless. They were good for nothing. Nabal was a good for nothing. He was unapproachable. No one can talk to him. He wouldn't take wisdom from anyone. He wouldn't listen to anyone's advice. Not his wife, not his cohort, not, not his servants. He was the kind of a person that you just, you couldn't reason with. Do you know anybody like that? Uh, now, don't shake your head. I mean, you know, but I mean, there are people like that in our world. They're just good for nothing, arrogant, cruel, and abusive. And if you go to talk to them, they will never listen to you ever. Their ears are closed. Their minds are closed. That's the kind of guy Nabal was. Nabal's response, his ignorant response. Nabal was responding the way that his character caused him to respond. Look down at verse 11. Notice four times the word I, four times the word my is used. He said, shall I then take my bread, my water, my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and I give it to men whose origins I don't even know. This was an arrogant, self-centered, good-for-nothing Cruel and abusive, unscrupulous man, Nabal, married to just the opposite. I don't know about you, but I have often asked myself the question as I've ever read and reflected on Nabal and Abigail, how in the world did this beautiful, sweet, kind, gentle woman get married to this low-life, unscrupulous guy? I think maybe I came up with an answer. Because there's something that we don't think about very often in our Western American culture. Marriages were arranged. She probably didn't fall in love with him when he was a nice, good-looking, handsome, loving kind of a guy and then he turned out to be this surly, you know, guy. She may have not had any choice in it. It was maybe it was an arranged marriage. I think that holds a lot of possibilities as to how Abigail got herself connected to this low life. Unfortunately, sometimes in our Western American culture, there are times when somebody acts very differently than they really are when they're in courtship. Oh, during courtship, you know. They're a real gentleman or she's a real lady and, you know, you put on your best and all that and then all of a sudden you get married and within a year or two or three, it's not quite the same. You need to be careful about that. I mean, we need to be very careful about the people we choose. And here, however Nabal and Abigail were together as husband and wife, however it was, Abigail was absolutely the opposite. Well, we're going to look at Abigail. We're going to look at how she was just the opposite. But I, let me give you something to think on as you go out this week. What a contrast chapters 24 and 26 are to chapter 25. Chapter 24, David could have killed Saul. 
But he chose not to. Remember we talked about how David didn't carry a grudge. David didn't want vengeance on his own. He gave place to God's wrath. He was willing to let God have his time. Chapter 26, we're going to see much the same thing. David will once again spare Saul's life. Once again, he won't act out of vengeance, but woo, not so much in chapter 25. And we're going to look at David's reaction initially, and then his reaction eventually to this encounter with the fool Naboth. Well, you know, I found it interesting this morning, and I'll close with this. I found it interesting as I was reading our, as we were reading our scripture reading for this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because it was about foolishness and wisdom. You know, sometimes people come and they hear the word of God and they listen and they, and they know what they should do, but they walk away and they turn it down and... They say, Lord, some other day, some other time, maybe some time before I die, I'll get right with you. And, and they don't realize that today is their last day on planet Earth. Sometimes we as believers say, okay, Lord, someday I'll get my life right with you. I'll confess my sin and I'll get right. And, but not today, Lord. Those are foolish decisions. You know what? This morning as we close, may you... Make sure that you're going to walk out of here right with God. Let's pray. Father, what a joy to know that in a story like Nabal, Abigail, David, men, Nabal's men, they will teach us lessons about how to respond and how not to respond. I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. That we would be the kind of people that would respond in a biblical fashion so that we could glorify you in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.